um, as we move along here, um, I'm going to have to define some terminology for you so that we're on the same page. So the word creed, first of all, comes from a Latin word, credo, which means I believe. In Greek we say pisteuo, from pistis, I believe, things I have faith in. So the word in Arabic uh, is aqida, which uh, the root, so it's from a triliteral root, aqada, which means to tie or to bind or to, or to, uh, to hold down, to tie a knot. Uh, so the word uqda you'll find in the Quran, for example, the uh, prayer of Moses at the burning bush, he prays to God. According to the Quran, he says, لِسَانِي Literally, unravel the knot from my tongue, which is translated, of course, remove the impediment from my speech. So this is uh, the cognate of this uh, in the Hebrew is the same letters, A and Kof and Dalit. And just as a side note, this word apida actually comes directly from uh, a word in the Hebrew Bible in Genesis chapter 22. Uh, Abraham binds his son Isaac and the Hebrew says, Yaakod et Yitzchak. Yaakod means then he bound his son. And that passage in the Hebrew Bible is called ha aqaida, the aqaida, the binding or the bounding of Isaac. So aqaida means a set of beliefs that are binding upon every Muslim. Every Muslim is, a, is it's incumbent upon every Muslim to believe uh, in these tenets. So when we talk about creed, we're essentially talking about three areas of study, three major areas, as you can see on the handout, the first area is known as theology, which is ilahiyat, who is God, what are the attributes of God, uh, what are the conceivabilities for God, what are the inconceivabilities for God. Now early orthodox dialecticians, which are called the mutakallimun, they actually had to come up with a working definition for God. And you're probably thinking, well, how can you define God? How can you express uh, the infinite with finite language and so on and so forth? We have to understand that they had to do this out of necessity. Why did they have to do it out of necessity? Because, this is very important, the nature of creedal language is that it's polemical. It's responsive. It's reactionary. They're responding to certain elements within the tradition that are saying things that they deem to be heterodox or not correct, and we'll talk about what that means. So their definition of God is very simple. They say al-wajibul wujud, the one who has vital existence, al-mustahiq li jami'il al-kamalat, he is deserving of every perfection, al-mutanazih an jami'il al-naqais, and he is transcendent or he is free from every type of deficiency. And of course this very broad definition, Jews and Christians would also agree with this definition, but it's sort of puts us in the right direction, so to speak. Um, so, this, why do Muslims study creed? It's actually uh, an obligatory uh, field of study for every Muslim to have some knowledge of creed because it acts as a protection against deviant beliefs. That's number one. And the other reason is it's incumbent upon every Muslim to love God, right? So this is the ultimate goal of studying theology. And every, like I said, every Muslim has to have some level of theological education uh, in order to have a relationship with God. So the Muslim scholars say, before there's mahabba, before there's love of God, there must be gnosis of God. There must be ma'rifatullah. You must have knowledge in order to love something. You can't love something you don't know. This is the philosophy behind it. So Muslims believe in this doctrine known as progressive revelation, uh, where uh, this aspect is not new to the Islamic tradition. This is something that's found in the previous revelations and dispensations, as Muslims would say. For example, very quickly in Mark chapter 12, a scribe comes to Jesus and says, What is the greatest commandment? Here are Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he continues and he says, and he's quoting from the Torah, and he says, And you must love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, and the construction in Hebrew, you have a conjunction with a perfect tense, which makes it imperative. You must love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with the kol nafshecha, with the kol meyotecha, all of thy strength and with all of thy being. So this is something that is the point of studying theology. This is the goal, this is the aim, this is the objective of studying theology, is to draw near to the divine, right? So it's not something where a Muslim will learn all of these different 
uh, uh, do's and don'ts and these different parameters and whatnot and just be able to rehash them like a parrot. That's not the point of it. Even though that's important, we should, we should know, Muslims are taught to know the parameters of their beliefs and what's acceptable and whatnot, but that's not the ultimate goal of it. So that's the first area is theology. The second area is known as prophetology or nubuat. So this deals with the nature and function of prophets, the conceivabilities for prophets, the inconceivability for prophets. Now there are certain Muslims known as uh, the Ash'ari. We'll talk about who are the Ash'ari. It's an acceptable school of theology amongst the tradition that will take a subcategory of nubuat called mystical prophetology. And this deals with uh, what's known as the reality of the Muhammadan nature, uh, or the idea that the Prophet Muhammad has ontological or temporal precedence over the rest of creation. Not a, uh, an, an, an essential or absolute pre-existence, that's only for God. But the sense that the Prophet is the best of creation, while he was sent last in temporality and time, his creation, the creation of his soul, actually predates the creation of Adam. Um, whether, whether Muslims believe in this or not, at the end of the day, is of little consequence, because either way, the prophet is still creation, and this is the whole point, that there's nothing uncreated except God and his attributes. So this roughly approximates the Aryan position represented at Nicaea in 325, the group of Christians that, he that held that very position about Jesus. They called Jesus Katisma Teleon, the best of creation. Their motto was, Ein Pate Hate Uk Ein, which is Greek, which means uh, there was a time when he was not. There was a time when Jesus was not. This type of belief uh, is probably influenced the early theologians of the Ash'ari tradition as well. Um, the third area of study is called super-rational transmissions. These are semiyat in Arabic. So these are events that are incumbent upon every Muslim to believe in. Okay? But these are events that are only known through what's known as naql, or revelation. So these are events that are known through a text of some sort that Muslims believe to be sacred. For example, the Qur'an, which is the uncreated pre-eternal speech of God according to the Islamic theologians. Or hadith, okay? Hadith are rigorously authenticated statements attributed to the Prophet Muhammad. And when theologians look at the hadith, the statements of the Prophet, because there's millions of hadith and there are different grades and whatnot, they only take the best of the best to derive creedal statements from, to make sure that the most, that there's no dissension, most people believe in it, so it's easier to canonize. So they would take hadith that have reached a level known as tawatur, multiple attestation, and there's only less than a thousand of those hadith out of the something, three million hadith. Okay, so, <clears throat> so uh, the super rational transmissions, for example, What's an example of a super-rational transmission? Like the night journey and ascension of the prophet, right? Or the standing on the concourse on the day of judgment. Right? These are things that are only known through revelation. You can't prove these things empirically, right? You can't prove very much empirically. But since they're mentioned in revelation, and they're multiply attested, it's incumbent upon Muslims to believe in them. The intercession of the prophet, for example, on the day of judgment. Many things, the crossing the bridge, for example. The questioning in the grave. So, the study of Islamic creed not only deals with what Muslims believe, but why do they believe it. Okay? But language cannot describe the reality of faith. That's ineffable. And we're not, we're not trying to describe what faith is or what experiential theology is. We're only using language to describe what Muslims believe and why do they believe it. What were the forces, theological, social, historical, and otherwise, that motivated early formulaic creedal articulations by the scholars of Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So this title, Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that's the that's the large title of Sunni orthodoxy. Okay, so when you hear when you, when you hear me say Sunni orthodoxy, I'm referring to Ahlus Sunnah wal Jama'ah, which literally means the people of the prophetic precedent and the majority. Okay. Um, so one of my professors at uh, GTU. Uh, Jean-Francois Racine, he studied under Bart Ehrman, who is, of course, famous for misquoting Jesus, orthodox corruption of scripture and whatnot. He's an expert of, uh, in uh, the field of um, textual criticism of the New Testament. He, he coined a, a, a term, which I'm going to use, I think it's a brilliant term, called proto-orthodox. Proto-orthodox, or the forerunners of orthodoxy. 
So proto-Orthodox scholars represented what would eventually become standard belief in that tradition. So this is before creeds were codified. Okay? We call them proto-Orthodox. Of course, uh, versus the heterodox. Heteros in Greek meaning other. Right? So this is considered to be a deviant position. This probably takes cue from Paul's letter to the Galatians when he chastises them for believing in heteron evangelion, or another gospel, a different gospel, a heretical gospel. So orthodoxy, straight thinking, heterodoxy, deviant teaching. So I'll utilize this term proto-orthodoxy, which will be used interchangeably with proto-Sunni. So proto-Sunni scholars are Muslim scholars who represented what eventually would become the standard Sunni belief forerunners of Islamic orthodoxy. So very quickly, just very, very quickly, because it'll help us to give us some, it'll help us conceptualize, we're going to see what happened in the Christian tradition. There are obvious parallels, and it'll help us conceptualize. So there's a three-step, uh, there's three steps in, in creedal canonization, and it usually takes about four centuries. Ironically, this took four centuries in Christianity and in Islam. The first step is called proclamation. which leads to a clarification, and then you have a codification or canonization. This usually takes four centuries. It took about four centuries in the Christian tradition and the Islamic tradition. So I'll give you an example very quickly. So you have Jesus and his disciples who believe certain tenets. They had faith convictions. They proclaimed them. It's called the Kerugma, the early Christian proclamation. By the end of the first century, maybe earlier, to the fourth century, you have all of these different groups coming out, uh, having different Christologies, different ideas of who Jesus was, different soteriologies, different ideas or concepts of salvation. So you have groups like Ebionites and Marcionites and Patripassians and Modalists and all Gnostics and the Docetae, all of these different groups claiming to be in the Christian tradition. And then you have the proto-Orthodox Christians. Now, most of these groups had their share of specialists. They have speculative theologians. They had polemical theologians. What did they do? They busied themselves writing refutations of their opponents and clarifying their positions. Okay? So they would busy themselves writing refutations of their opponents and clarifying their positions. So the Proto Orthodox Christian fathers, for example, like Clement and Origen, Justin, Irenaeus, Eusebius, many, many more. So by the fourth century, you have the time of the great codifiers of the 4th century of the Christian era, the great codifiers, like Athanasius of Alexandria in the uh, Greek East, Augustine of Hippo in the Latin West, Cappadocian church fathers in Asia Minor, the two great Greeks, St. Basil. What did they do? They refined and systematized the beliefs of their, of their proto-Orthodox predecessors. They refined and systematized their belief. Therefore, the earliest proto-Orthodox Christian creeds come from this period, the 4th century, the Apostolic Creed, the Athanasian Creed, the Nicene Creed after 325, the Niceo-Constantinopolitan Creed after 381, which is the most orthodox creed. Okay, so following this line, now we can look at Islam, what happened in the Islamic tradition. So similarly, you have the Prophet Muhammad and his disciples, and the Prophet lived from 570 to 632 of the Common Era, and they likewise proclaimed a message known as a Risala. So it was called a Kerugma in the Christian tradition. In the Islamic tradition, it's called a Risala. <clears throat> now here's something interesting. The first generation of Muslims, the first generation known as the Sahaba, they did not engage in speculative discourse, what's known as Ilmul Kalam. They didn't engage in Kalam. Uh, there was no need for it. Right. Uh, they never asked the questions, for example, was the Quran created? It never even occurred to them. Do human beings create their own actions? These things weren't brought up until later. They were issues until later. Like, like today, uh, the theists are asked questions like, you know, if uh, God is omnipotent, um, you know, it's the, the stone conundrum, right? Can he create a stone that's too heavy for him to lift? Can God, what was the one? Can he, can he warm up a burrito so hot that he can't eat it? Where they say, you know, where is God? Who created God? This type of thing, right? These questions didn't even occur to the first generation. And I think part of the reason why is they experienced their theology. There was no reason to question it. They experienced it. They're with the prophet, uh, and they saw him perform uh, these miracles uh, reportedly. So this was never an issue. 
with them. And likewise, with the original disciples of Jesus, they experienced their theology. So these questions weren't brought up until much later. Um, but you get into the second and third uh, generations, and as the empire, the Islamic empire is growing uh, under the Umayyad and the Abbasid dynasties, now you have uh, Jewish and Byzantine uh, and Persian peoples becoming Muslim, and then uh, looking at Islam through their own hermeneutical lens, so to speak. Right? So now these different ideas start coming up. Also, Muslims uh, came into contact with seasoned Jewish and Christian Hellenized philosophers. So many of these issues were raised. So what happened now? It necessitated, it necessitated reasoned responses and clarifications from these proto-Sunni scholars. It was necessary. Again, creedal language is by its nature responsive. It refutes heresies. It clarifies positions. Right? So the classic example uh, is uh, the Lagos of the Johannine Gospel. So when, when Islam went into the Levant or in Sham in Syria and into Egypt, uh, Christian philosophers had heard of the Quranic revelation and referred to Jesus Christ. So they were wondering, is this, and the Quran refers to Jesus as the Word of God, right? The angel said, O oh Mary, God gives you glad tidings of a word from him, Ismuhul Masih, who is called Christ, Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus, the son of Mary. So these uh, Hellenized Christian philosophers would ask the Muslims, is this the Lagos of the Yohanin Gospel, right? John 1.1. 1, 1? Where it says what N R K in Halagos. In the beginning was the Word, right? Which uh, implies that the Word has an essential pre-existence. Kai Halagos in Prostam Theon, and the Word was with God, meaning that the Word has a separate and distinct entity or existence, but there's some dynamic relationship with God. Kai Theos in Halagos, and God was the Word. They share an essential nature. So it necessitated, obviously it's not the same concept as the Kalimatullah, or the concept of Christ in Islam, but this is just an example of how or why Muslim theologians began now to study uh, Christian uh, theology in order to formulate reasoned responses to what they were hearing. Right? <clears throat> However, the first sectarian uh, had nothing to do with outside influences, meaning Hellenistic, Jewish, Christian, Byzantine, or Persian. So I'm going to. So it's on the sheet here. I'm going to uh, go through these these heterodox groups of, of, of Muslims and demonstrate to you uh, how these groups influenced the codification, right, the canonization of Islamic formulaic creedal articulations. How did these groups influence creedal literature? The first group I'm going to talk about are known as the Khawarij. The Khawarij, meaning seceders or the Karajites, uh, this was actually at the time of the first generation, towards the end of the first generation of Muslims in the 7th century. They uh, were nomadic Bedouin for the most part. They were not trained by any of the companions of the Prophet, at least that's the Muslim claim. Uh, they espoused a very puritanical type of fire and brimstone uh, theology. They believed that if a Muslim committed a mortal sin, then they had apostated from the community, and it was their right to kill that person. So they would actually go down into cities and hamlets, and they would raid them, and they would indiscriminately massacre everyone. Montgomery Watt calls, uh, calls their actions pure, pure or sheer terrorism. So obviously, this, we have an element of neo uh in the world today as well. They're very exclusivist, right? If you didn't believe exactly as I believed, and you're not even a Muslim. This type of thing, very exclusive, this type of belief. Uh, they would anathematize uh, companions of the Prophet who did not believe as they believed. In other words, it would make takfir of them. Anathematize means they would declare them as being apostates and they would kill them. So the fourth caliph, for example, his name was Ali. He was the nephew of the Prophet. He was killed by a man of the Khawarij in Kufa, Iraq, in 661 of the Common Era. The man's name was uh, Abdurrahman ibn Muljam al Muradi. He stabbed the Caliph Ali as he was leaving the mosque. Uh, so that's the first group, the Khawarij. So that's what they believe. You, you commit a, a mortal sin, whether it's a small sin, from the minor sins, Sahar, or from the major sins, the Kaba'ir, 
You forfeited the rights of community, you've apostated, uh, and you are to be killed. <clears throat> this type of mentality. The second group are called the Shia. Now, I'm coming from a Sunni perspective, right? So if there's, if I was a Shi'i, for example, you would hear a very different story, right? So I'm coming from the perspective of a Sunni Muslim. So the Shi'a, partisans of Ali, these are viewed as diametrically opposed to the Khawarij. In other words, they uh, would come to believe that the fourth Caliph Ali was an infallible Imam or leader. Infallible. So they impute upon him a prophetic attribute, because Muslims believe that prophets are infallible, or free of major sin, and that he was ordained by God. The Shia believe that Ali was ordained by God to inherit the temporal uh, caliphate, the temporal kingdom of the Prophet, and they also believe certain companions of the Prophet uh, took advantage of the situation of the death of the Prophet and usurped power in order to take the caliphate away from the Caliph Ali. This is the largest sectarian today in the Muslim world, the Shia. The third group are called the Mujassima, the anthropomorphists, right? So these are people who made literal ta'wil or interpretation of Quranic verses that ostensibly, that apparently indicated uh, anthropomorphism. For example, in the Quran you read the Ain Allah, which can be translated the eye of God, or Yad Allah, which can be translated the hand of God, or the Sa'at, the shin, right? So the anthropomorphists, the Mujassama, they would take these verses as literal. So God literally has a hand, it's made of substance, He's, in, he's located in his creation. He's physically seated on a throne. He's wearing a robe. He has certain facial features like that. Very anthropomorphic, right? They're giving, they're ascribing human qualities or, cre or, or created qualities to the divine, right? So they say God has jism murakab. He has a compartmentalized body, for example. <clears throat> he dwells within his creation. So this idea of, of substance, right? Uh, Ajram in Arabic. This was also found to be very problematic amongst Christian theologians in the late 4th century. In the Nicene Creed it says that Jesus shares a substantia with God and they found this, they found this term substantia to be uh, scandalous, so they removed it from the, term, from the Creed in 381 of the Common Era. Muslims had a similar uh, run-in with the word substance with the Mujassima. And God is not made of substance. The Quran says, Laysa kemithlihi shaybun that there's nothing like God, and one of the uh, attributes of God, according to theologians, is which means that he is completely dissimilar to creation. And that eventually became the Sunni position, the orthodox position. Other groups, the Jabariya, these are the determinists, they said that man has no absolute, man has no volition, he has no free will, he is compelled to act, therefore he is not taken to account which means eventually they came to deny the existence of hell, right? And of course, hell is from the super-rational transmissions. It's mentioned in Hadith, it's mentioned in Qur'an, so that was deemed an acceptable position. And then you have Qadariya, the dualists. Man has absolute volition. God has nothing to do with evil, nothing to do with evil. He didn't create it, he's not, he's not pleased with it, he didn't, has nothing to do with it. So this was their answer to theodicy, the problem of evil in the world. They were called the Muslim Zoroastrians, because Zoroastrians were dualistic, believing two gods, right? God of good, God of evil. The most challenging group to the proto-Sunni, or proto-Orthodox, were the rationalists, the Mu'tazila, the rationalists. And part of the reason that they were so challenging is because they actually ruled the caliphate for over 200 years. So they were the ones in power for over 200 years, and they would actually... Uh, they would persecute proto-Orthodox scholars uh, for espousing certain beliefs. For example, the Mu'tazilite caliphs uh, believed that the Qur'an was created. This was a major issue back during this time. Is the Qur'an created? Is it uncreated? So the Mu'tazilite position is the Qur'an is created. The Sunni position is that it's uncreated. So any scholar that, that espoused that the Qur'an or taught his flock that the Qur'an was... Uh, was uh, uh, uncreated, was sometimes tortured, persecuted, sometimes killed. One such scholar, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, who is a scholar who had his own uh, codified school of jurisprudence. He had reached a level of complete juristic 
and methodological independence known as Ijtihad Mutlaq. He was actually tortured by the caliph uh, Ma'mun because he said the Quran is uncreated. There was another scholar, Imam Shafiri, who also was summoned to the caliph. And the caliph asked him, do you say that the Quran is, is, is uncreated? And he was very clever. So Imam Shafi'i, he, uh, he, he said the, the Torah, the Gospel, the Psalms, and the Quran, all of them are created. Right? So the caliph said, oh, great. You know, that's beautiful. You can, you're free to go. So Imam Shafi'i went back to his students, and his students said, we heard a rumor. Did, did you say that the Quran was, was created? And he said, no. I, all I did was point to my fingers and say, Kulluha makhluqa. All of these are created. My fingers. I just mentioned the four books and I pointed to my fingers and he let me go. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mutazilites also, they, so for the Mutazilites, remember we talked about the Sam'iyat, super rational transmission. This, the Mutazilite, they denied the Sam'iyat. They believe in theology, they believe in Nabuat, prophetology, but they said the Sam'iyat, they're not super rational, they're irrational. We're not going to believe in them. There's no punishment in the grave, that's, that's allegory. The prophet did not travel in body from Mecca to Jerusalem, that's ridiculous. There's no, um, uh, the physical body doesn't rise from the dead, it's, it's gone. It's, it's completely, it dissolves, dissolves and it's gone. But they believe in the soul, they believe in the afterlife. Uh, but some of these super rational transmissions, they did not believe in. They also rejected divine attributes. Uh, they saw this as imputing plurality upon the deity, right? So um, the Mutazilites um, would say uh, God doesn't have attributes. He is, uh, he is omnipotent in his very essence, whereas the Sunni position is that omnipotence is an attribute that is in addition to the essence, but is not attached nor detached from it. Um, so it's, I mean, from our perspective, who cares about this? But this was a major issue during this time. So, for example, what Tesla Lights would say, this pen isn't blue, right? It's blue in its very essence. Blue is the pen, and, and, and the pen is blue. There's no difference between blue and pen. It all emanates from the essence. Whereas the Sunni position would be, this is a pen, and it has an attribute of being blue. But outside of this essence, blue doesn't have any meaning, which obviously is not true because you have blue sky, you have blue cars, you have blue hats, and blue, so on and so forth. But obviously, uh, every, every analogy I give will, be, will fall short, because we're talking about these issues that are very hard to conceptualize. But apparently, this was an extremely big deal at the time. Does God have attributes? Does God not have attributes? So the Mutazilites said, God does not have attributes. They also believe that man creates his own actions. Right? In other words, man, man creates evil. So the, the Sunni orthodoxy will look at this and say, how can you say that God didn't create something? How can man create something? There's only one creator. And they would charge them for being polytheistic by saying that. Mutazilites also believed that works give salvation. Works give salvation. It's a misnomer even today, if you're familiar with like, uh, you know, polemical writings against Islam uh, by like, Christian apologists and polemicists. They'll say Muslims believe, for example, that if you're 51% good and 49% evil, you go to heaven. If you're 51% evil and 49% bad, then you go to hell. So your deeds are weighed. It's because the Quran talks about scales and things like that. Uh, but the orthodox position has always been, the, Sun, the proto, proto Sunni position has always been, that a person is saved only by the grace of God, not by their deeds. Although the deeds uh, are a byproduct of faith in God. Um, so this is just quick descriptions. So this was during the formative years. The clarification process. And now we move into codification. Okay? So the proto-Sunni fathers from the late 1st century uh, to the early 3rd century. Okay, so now actually we're back here in the clarification. They're working under the framework of Sunni orthodoxy. So some of these scholars, Abu Hanifa, for example, uh, Malik ibn Anas, Abu Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i, uh, Jaffa al-Sadiq ibn Muhammad, Hassan al-Basri, Sa'id ibn Musayyib, on and on and on these proto-Orthodox uh, Muslim scholars. Um, and, of course, the, we saw these are the equivalent of, for example, Justin Martyr, Eusebius, Irenaeus, and the Christian tradition. Um, so by the late 3rd century, early 4th century, much like, again, we saw in the Christian tradition, we have the great codifiers of creed. And three men 
stand above the rest, and they're on the handout here. The first one, Abu Mansur al Maturidi, who died in 944 of the Common Era. Uh, he's from Samarkand, he was a Persian. Abu Hassan al Ash'ari, who was uh, from Iraq, 936 of the Common Era. So these two men worked independently, yet they came to very similar conclusions. They differed in minor areas that are considered to be negligible. So the definition, the traditional definition of a Sunni Muslim is a Muslim who adheres to the theological school of either Maturidi or Ash'ari, or both. And some say there's a third school, the Ath'ari school, or the Salafi school as well. But definitely the school of these two men is considered to be Sunni orthodoxy. So what are some of the differences between the two? For example, Imam Ash'ari said that it's conceivable for a woman to be a prophet. And there's an opinion amongst the Ash'aris that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a prophetess. Or that Asiya, the wife of the Pharaoh, was a prophetess. The Maturidi say this is only an office or a function of men. That's one of the differences. Another difference, and this actually is a big difference, I think, uh, is the Ash'aris uh, say that uh, the intellect must be aided by revelation in order to arrive at true theology. Whereas the Maturidi position is the intellect is sufficient to know God, right? So Imam Ash'ari said there's four conditions that make it incumbent upon someone to become Muslim, for example. And three of them Imam Maturidi agreed with. They are intellect, they are maturity, uh, and the third one is, uh, where's the third one? Intellect, maturity, sound senses, they're not blind and deaf. They can be either or, but not blind and deaf. The fourth one, Imam Ash'ari said, uh, and it's unique in his opinion, is that he said, Balagat, Balagatu ad-da'wat sahiha that a, a correct prophetic summons should have reached that person. That if a correct prophetic summons, the correct message of a prophet, whether it's a prophet Moses or Jesus or Muhammad or Abraham or Noah, uh, and, uh, any prophet, if a person was not reached by that message in a good form, a correct form, not a corrupted form, if it didn't reach that person, then they're not responsible to believe in God because the intellect is not enough to arrive that true theology must be aided by revelation. Right. <clears throat> so I think that's actually a, a pretty major difference. Interestingly, Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari was a Mu'tazilite for over 30 years. He was a Mu'tazilite scholar. He studied under Abu Ali al jabbari who was a Mu'tazilite master. And then he became, and then he left that and joined the proto-Sunni movement in the 4th century, and eventually became one of its great codifiers. The third scholar here, Abu Jaffa at Tahawi, he was from Egypt. Um, I have a copy of his creed called At Tahawiya, and I want to actually quote from the creed to demonstrate to you the polemical nature, the responsive nature, reactionary nature of creedal statements. <clears throat> so, what did these three men do? They refined and systematized the beliefs of their predecessors. Okay. So the creed of Imam at tahawi is the simplest and the most popular creed. It's only 130 statements. Rowan Williams, uh, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, he read the creed, and he liked it, and he encourages his diocese, in fact, all Christians, all Catholics and Protestants, to read this book to get a good idea, an authentic idea, as to what Muslims actually believe in. Right? Hear it from a Puerto Orthodox Muslim scholar from the formative years of Islam, and not from, uh, you know, some pundit or something like that. So he says, read this book. So we're going to look at a few of these statements, and we'll end with this, God willing, just to demonstrate to you the nature of creedal literature. Remember we said from the outset, the nature of creedal literature is that it's responsive. So he, he says here in statement 74, he says, وَلَا نُخَالِفُ جَمَعَةَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ He says, we do not dissent from the majority of Muslims, right? And claiming the majority legitimizes his creed because there's a hadith of the Prophet which is considered to be a sound hadith in which he said, Ya Allahi ma'al jama'ati, oh, ala jama'ati, that the, the, the literally hand of God or the, the protective power of God is with the majority. Right? So this, is, this statement is aimed or directed against heterodox denominations. 
Statement number 56. He says here, وَالسَّعِيدُ مَنْ سَعِيدَ بِقَضَاءِ اللَّهِ وَالشَّقِيُّ مَنْ شَقِيَ بِقَضَاءِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى So he says, those saved are ultimately saved by God's decision or grace. And those damned are ultimately damned by God's decision. So this is a polemic against who? The Mu'tazilite, the rationalist, who said a person's deeds give them salvation or give them eternal damnation. Another example, statement 107 in the Creed. Oh, this is a, this is a good one. فَعَالُ الْعِبَادِ هِيَ خَلْقُ اللَّهِ وَكَسْبٌ مِنَ الْعِبَادِ That human actions are God's creations, but humanity's acquisitions. So this is the Sunni way of dealing with theodicy, the problem of evil, that God created evil. He created everything. He created evil actions, but since man has limited free will, he will take the consequences of those actions because of a limited free will. So this goes against the Mortezilites. It's a polemic against them, because the Mortezilites said man creates his own actions. It's against the determinists, right, who said man has no volition, and against the uh, dualists as well, so man has absolute volition. Right? Human actions are created by God, even evil actions. God created everything. God is the only creator. But since man has a limited free will, that he takes the consequences of those actions. A um, couple more here are interesting. Al-Imanu, so this is number uh, 80, statement 80 out of 130. Al-Imanu, uh, I'm sorry, وَلَا يَخْرُجُ الْعَبْدُ مِنَ الْإِمَانِ إِلَّا بِجُحُودِ مَا أَدْخَلُهُ فِيهِ Statement number 79, actually. The believer does not lose his or her faith except by denying that which made him or her a believer. So this is a polemic against the Khawarij, right? The seceders who said what? That if a Muslim commits a mortal sin, whether small or large, if a Muslim lies to someone or cheats someone, they've left Islam, they've apostated. So here he's saying that unless a Muslim denies that which made him or her a Muslim, right, then they're still a Muslim. In other words, if they, if they deny a, an essential article of faith, then they leave the faith, not because they did some sin. The Muslim position is everyone commits a sin, commits sins. A couple more here, one number 118 and 119. وَنُحِبُّ أَسْحَابِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَلَا نُفَرِّتُ فِي حُبِّ أَحَدٍ مِّنْهُمْ We love the companions of God's messenger, and we do not have extreme love for any of them. وَنُثْبِتُ الْخِلَافَةَ بَعْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَوَّلًا لِأَفِي بَقْرَ السَّدِّيقِ رضي الله تعالى عنه And we assert the caliphate after the passing of the messenger went to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. So this is a polemic against Shia who were saying that certain companions of the Prophet usurped his, that Ali's caliphate. So he works this into the creed as well. Number 35, almost done here. Yeah, we have a little time. This is interesting. Inna al-Qur'an kalam Allah. That the Qur'an is the word of God. Min hu bada bila kayfiyatin qawlan. Emanated from God without modality in its, in its expression. There's no modality. There's no how. It's beyond comprehension. It is unlike human speech, which is uh, it is unlike human speech which is created. Whoever hears it and says, This is like human speech, has disbelieved. So this is a polemic against again the Mu'tazilites, who said the Quran was created, not uncreated. The Sunni position is that the Quran reflects pre-eternal meanings. It's an attribute of God, therefore it's uncreated. The last one here. وَمَنْ وَصَفَ اللَّهُ بِمَعْنَى مِنْ مَعَنِ الْبَشَرُ فَقَدْ كَفَرَ Whoever describes God as having human characteristics has disbelieved. And obviously this is a polemic directed against the mujassima, or the anthropomorphists, who are very literal in their interpretation of verses in the Quran. So the conclusion is, Islamic creed did not fall out of the sky. It was the product of three centuries of rigorous scholarship in the face of other religious traditions, heterodox understandings, as well as socio-political factors. Therefore, creedal literature tends to be responsive and polemical in nature. So, that's the end of my spiel, to use a Yiddish word. Um, <laughs> if there's any questions or comments, uh, I'll try to entertain them.
Uh, if not, um, thank you for coming. I appreciate the opportunity. <clears throat> Yes, sir. Um, so you mentioned that Imam Abu Mansur and Imam Abu Hassan um, fall under the majority of the Sunnis. Um, yeah. Imam Abu Jafar at Tahawi, what exactly is he? Because yes, uh, what question. is he uh, Imam at Tahawi, uh, he was a contemporary of Ash'ari uh, and Matudidi. So his creedal articulation uh, is considered to be valid by both the Ash'aris and the Matudidis. Okay, so um, he didn't have a uh, his students did not codify his opinions. It just happened like that. That the, that the students of Ash'ari and Maturidi, they codified their teachers' opinions because they're probably more popular than at Tahawi. But at, as time went on, the creed of at Tahawi became the most popular creedal treatise, even more than the, 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 the creed of Ash'ari and Maturidi. That's why I'm quoting from the creed of Imam at Tahawi. Uh, but he himself, uh, his, his juristic uh, identity was Hanafi. Uh, um, and he's considered to be uh, Maturidi, uh, he's more leaning towards Maturidi in his Aqidah, uh, based on his statements. Um, but he's basically summarizing the opinions of Ash'ari and Maturidi, but his opinions weren't codified like the other two men were. There could have been a third school of theology known as the Tahawiyah or something, it just wasn't codified. But it's the simplest creed. It's only, like I said, only 130 statements. It's pretty easy to follow. Um, so this is a, this is the book that I recommend to uh, uh, non-Muslims who want, even Muslims who want to know what do the Orthodox say about Islamic creed or Islamic belief. And difference of opinion is something that has been in this religious community in Islam since the very beginning. Uh, Imam Ash'ari he wanted to write a book on the differences. The juristic differences amongst the four scholars. Just a book on the differences within Sunni orthodoxy. And it turned out to be 130 volumes long. Just on the differences within Sunni orthodoxy. So there's a lot of, it's certainly not a monolithic uh, tradition. There's a lot of diversity, even today. Christianity, Islam, Judaism, they're very, very diverse. Any comments or questions? I hope I didn't bore anyone. <laughs> Obviously, this I'm going very fast. Yes, yes. Sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I think uh, I'm trying to read my notes here. Okay. You said there were about a thousand statements or hadith, like about three million that are considered creedal. Is that is that common to the Shia as well, or is that just specific to Sunni? Good question. So there's, yeah, there's millions of hadith, 1,000 or so are considered to be multiply attested. Those, are, those thousand hadith, scholars of Sunni orthodoxy, have derived creedal statements and legislation from. The Shia have different books of hadith. They don't accept the vast majority of the hadith of the Sunnis. Uh, and the reasoning behind it is that they believe the narrators of those hadith are unreliable. Uh, for example, um, out of the six companions of the Prophet to narrate over a thousand hadith, uh, one of them was Aisha, the Prophet's wife, uh, and the Shia had a very unfavorable opinion about her. And Abu Huraira also, he's a companion of the Prophet, a very unfavorable opinion of him as well, for various reasons. Um, so the vast majority they don't accept. They would accept hadith related, for example, by Ali, which are only about, a, there's only 142 of them, only 142 hadith related by the Caliph Ali. So those they would tentatively accept, but they have their own hadith collections. Um, Shia creed uh, is it's at times significant, significantly different than, than Sunni creed. Uh, but most Sunnis would say that um, even with that said, they're still considered to be within the fold of Islam. Uh, there are some conservative uh, Hanafis, for example, that would say that they're, 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 they're not Muslim. But that's a very much minority opinion from a creedal standpoint.